I have been sharing with you for the last several months uh, one of my own, call it travels, and that was losing weight. And I think most of you are aware I've, I've well, I've lost not a ton, but <laughs> a big chunk of my overall body weight. But I also wanted to, I've been sharing the last couple of weeks, I also wanted to mention that. I've been sharing with you that I have lost several inches. Just when I was, my neck alone, when I was told I'd drop four inches off my neck measurement, I noticed something was up. I went to a dinner in February, late February, and I put on a dress shirt I bought last summer at some fancy store in Boise, and I put it on, and all of a sudden it was like my head and neck were rattling around in the shirt. And you almost have to keep tying the tie tighter, so you. but then the collar bunches up. But it was clear evidence, so four inches off the neck. Total Body Transformation System is not a yo-yo diet. It's not a fad diet. It was developed by a company that's been in business over 20 years with an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau, backed up by a scientific team of researchers from some of the most prestigious universities in the country. And I wanted to point out you'll burn, scientifically proven, six times more fat and lose eight times more weight than normal results from diet and exercise alone, the meal replacement plan is generally healthier than the meals you're replacing. Also, you still get a healthy amount of calories, and the meal replacement costs about the same as the groceries you'd be replacing. Also, the average participant will drop 22 pounds and lose four inches off his or her waist in just 60 days. And I also wanted to point out it's backed up with an unconditional 30-day money-back guarantee. You can contact marketing executive Don Chandler. He's also a customer. He lost in excess of 50 pounds. Don's telephone number, 208-731-3560. Once more, Don's number, 731-3560. 925 on Top Story on KLIX. Bill Colley with you this morning. We're at 37. On our way, well, it's not going to be a terrible day. Tomorrow is going to be the nicest day of the week. Near 70 in some spots. And then, unfortunately, things go south again uh, as we head toward the weekend. It seems to be a pattern we've developed lately. A quick note, the weather is a service of Mountain Home Auto Ranch in Mountain Home, Idaho. I have a couple of notes here on my, my, my what I call my chicken scratching sheet. Just to mention when I wrote war. Well, I don't necessarily mean war, but I mean what's, what's transpiring in places like Syria as well as perhaps on the Korean Peninsula over the last few days, and it, 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 it is, you sit here and you say, okay, nothing's really going to happen. Uh, nothing could possibly, it, it won't spiral out of control. They said the same thing in 1914. I brought that up the other day. I read the great book years ago, uh, The Guns of August by the author Barbara Tuckman, and sometimes things just start spinning out of control and you get to a point where you didn't expect to be. But a lot of this I had mentioned yesterday developed back during the Obama years. And media is starting to come out after all these years of saying Barack Obama could do no wrong. The Washington Post is now attacking what happened in Syria when Obama claimed there were no chemical weapons left. Susan Rice was joining him in saying that. The Associated Press this morning did a long fact-check piece on it. I mean, long. And essentially, without using the word liar, concluded that Obama was lying for political purposes. Richard Haas, who is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, which doesn't necessarily have your best interests at heart. It's controlled by special interests. But every now and then, a stop clock is uh, right twice a day. I can say that because I wear an old-fashioned watch with two hands on it. And actually three if you count the second hand. Richard Haas appearing on MSDNC's Morning Joe. Speaking with Joe Scarborough, the, they, the show is named after him, and Scarborough was wondering why now so many Democrats, as well as media, are tossing Obama under the bus. You had you had other people saying uh, saying some things that were almost disloyal to Barack Obama, saying we could have never moved this quickly, he would have never moved. Why were they doing that? Why did they all come out in force and do that? Well, there was a lot of frustration. There was a sense that the Obama presidency was a bit of a paralysis by analysis. And in some ways, it was such a tight center. It was the president, Ben Rhodes, and a few others who then afterwards tried to make the case that what they did was a solution to the chemical problem in, in Syria when everybody knows it wasn't. No, history is going to be rough on this. This is going to be the defining 
moment for the Obama presidency. And what is so interesting about it, it's going to be a moment of inaction. And it proves the point that what you don't do can matter every bit as much as what you do when you, when you govern. And I think all these people, one disagreed at the time, they're probably thinking about their, their, their futures. But uh, essentially it showed also that President Obama was something of a departure from the Democratic foreign policy national security mainstream. And they're pointing out that John Kerry and Hillary Clinton supported what President Trump did. As it turns out, John Kerry, for all the bad mouthing we've done of him over the years, was counseling in the background, we need to do something and we're not doing enough. And Mr. Obama said, oh, come on now, John, I won my elections. Ha, 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 ha. This is from Fox News. Fox News reached back into history. Take a listen. Just think about what we've done these last eight years without firing a shot. We've eliminated Syria's declared chemical weapons program. All of these steps have helped keep us safe and helped keep our troops safe. Those are the result of diplomacy. If we don't have strong efforts there, the more you will be called upon to clean up after the failure of diplomacy. We were able to find a solution that actually removed the chemical weapons that were known from Syria in a way that the use of force would never have accomplished. That was Susan Rice following the president's remarks, and that goes back several years. It turns out they knew all along that Syria wasn't going to be going along with this and that the Russians knew as well that Syria wasn't going to go along with it, but they were just looking to win more election cycles. Hey, we're peacemakers. We've settled the issue. No, when I said there was a red line, don't cross it. I wasn't just bluffing. Bill Colley with you. I'll take some of your calls following the break. It's 9.30. 37 right now on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Sean Spicer uh, made a comment yesterday during the White House press briefing that's getting a lot of attention. And he was asked, What's the president's justification for doing this? I saw somebody comment on one of my posts on LinkedIn this morning and saying, We've been at war for a long time, therefore we can do this. Well, we haven't specifically been at war with Syria. The authorization that came from Congress dealt with al-Qaeda. And al-Qaeda is actually fighting the Syrian government. So we stepped in and we helped al-Qaeda's enemy in this situation with this strike. Now, I also had mentioned that the president is commander-in-chief only, according to Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, when he is called to be commander-in-chief. Now, the argument might be from the Obama White House and from Spicer that that's an ambiguous passage. It doesn't say called by Congress specifically. But if you go back earlier and you go to Article 1, Section uh, 8, you have this. To declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. This is about the responsibilities of Congress as it's being outlined. To raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money that shall uh, use or that use shall be for a longer term than two years, to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. You get it? This is all Congress's job. So all of those people out there saying, well, yeah, but most of you who talk Constitution apparently have never read it. That's an argument that's getting glossed over here because if, you know, if you're a Trumpista, it's, a, it's a, the cult of personality. You'll babble on about the Constitution. Well, that's what the Constitution says. And the Constitution says the president needs the authorization of Congress. And if you're sitting out there saying, well, I'm a big Second Amendment proponent. Well, what parts of the Constitution do you choose to pick and use? It's like those folks out there who liberals will tell you about a passage in the Bible but ignore everything else it says in order to make their argument. We have a caller with us. Caller, you're up next. It's 936 on KLIX. Hey, good morning. If you want to know why Trump is carrying out the same war that Hillary said she was going to carry out if she got in office and why the Constitution has absolutely nothing to do with anything that happens in this country, go to highimpactflix.com and punch up the most recent video, and you'll see. It explains it all. High impact? Highimpactflix.com. Okay. I'll check that out when I get a chance after the program. Thanks much for the call. Uh, 736-0300, telephone number to reach us, 736-0300. A 
Pat Buchanan makes a good point today. 400,000 people have already died in the Syrian civil war, and many of them were infants and children. Blown to bits by bombs. Some of those bombs dropped by the Syrian Air Force. Some, uh, some of those bombs are delivered by ISIS, Al-Qaeda. Some dropped by the Russians. And did you know that in Syria alone, during his tenure in office, I read this Will Bunch, who's a columnist for the Philadelphia Daily News. He wrote a book many, many years ago called The Backlash about the Tea Party. And I got to meet Will because he interviewed me for the, for the book. Uh, and Will designates me and not Rick Santelli from CNBC as ground zero for the creation of the Tea Party for an event that took place where I, with a group of listeners, we invaded a town hall meeting in 2009 that my congressman was holding. My sister jokes that half the first chapter of the book is about me. Will uh, is writing, and, and he's got a great column, even though he's a fairly liberal guy, a great column about this. And he says, I saw it last night before I went to bed. Barack Obama dropped more than 26,000 bombs on Syria as president. Now, did he drop them himself? No, but he ordered the dropping of them. So it's likely American bombs have torn apart the limbs of infants and children in Syria as well because they call it collateral damage. You don't intend to do it. Now we, we're getting in there saying, well, you know, they use chemical weapons. Well, all right, would you rather die by a chemical weapon or being blown to shreds by a bomb? You would likely say neither. The point of the matter is I know that Syria violated the agreement and has violated other agreements on the use of, they've used chlorine gas. Did you know that's not part of the agreement? They can use all of that that they want. This is how strange some of these agreements are. They don't cover everything. And, and I think that we've got to start putting this in some perspective and realize this is not our fight. And I know that it made Mr. Trump look like a strong leader. And I, I know there may be benefits from that. But again, go back to the Constitution. Which part of that should we rip out so that you can still keep cheering Donald Trump on and hope that he does more of this? Because even here in Idaho, a lot of those people who used to be old Paulites, that is, they 28, uh, 2008, 2012, they backed Ron Paul. And he is the most strict constructionist I've ever met in American politics, presidential politics, that is, running for office that I think we've ever come across, probably since, but way back in the 1800s. A lot of those old Paulites here in Idaho immediately turned around and glommed on to Donald Trump during the campaign. Now, I'm not throwing Trump completely under the bus here. A lot of people in government say this was a one-off. Let's hope it was. But how do these people who voted for Ron Paul twice or supported him in two election cycles then turn around and keep beating the drum for Donald Trump and then using the word constitution as if it backs them up because it doesn't? 20 minutes away from 10 o'clock. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, NewsRadio1310.com. We've got to borrow $325 million in Idaho to fix roads and bridges. Donald Trump said it would be America first. Do you want to spend your blood and treasure overseas, or do you want to drive on better roads here? I uh, was thinking a little bit this morning about a call I got many, many years ago. and was hosting a radio program, and we had one of these issues where it was then President Obama, but President Obama had struck out at some bad guy, and he hadn't actually gotten any authorization. And I got a call from a fellow who said, look, I don't support President Obama on most issues, but the guy said, I served in the military, and I approve of what he did. And I said to the caller, when you were in the military, did you take an oath to the Constitution or to the president? Long pause. So which one of these should we honor? Are you in violation of your oath if you, uh, you no longer support it? Uh, that's, uh, see, we put people in, I don't mean to like, give you a hard time, but the fact of the matter is, have you asked these questions yourself through all of this? As I understand it, the Chinese have moved a lot of troops up to the North Korean border. Now, this morning on Fox and Friends, they were selling this as if, uh, as if, well, they're worried about the refugees streaming across, and that's to stop the refugees from streaming across. I'm sure China is very worried about that. I don't doubt it. But on the other hand, in 1950, they sent troops up to the border too, and uh, they didn't stand there and wait for the refugees. They crossed the border and they engaged the United Nations troop led, uh, troops led by the United States. And it was not pretty. 944, Bill Colley with you. Are we ready to get into this? That's the question. 
are we ready to embark on this? We're $20 trillion in debt. Our roads have potholes that could swallow Volkswagens. We've had a call already this morning about school funding. We realize that's a critical issue. you got people out there who say, if they try to take away my Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid, you know, come heck or high water. Well, you can't continue to afford to play policeman of the planet. Now, if someone attacks us, we've got to defend ourselves. Were we attacked here? Well, Rand Paul, he's the son of Ron Paul, senator from Kentucky, appearing with Michael Smirconish on CNN. Smirconish used to have a very successful conservative radio talk show many, many years ago. Uh, now he's primarily just a talking head at CNN. I know it's a come down from where he was. Uh, listen to Paul, though. And he, he was asked, was the United States of America threatened by Syria's actions? No, I think as horrific as the attacks were and as heartrending as the uh, pictures and the atrocity and the children dying, um, I don't believe that there was a national security interest of the United States. And that's why you have the debate, because it's too often we all, we all, everybody knows the buzzwords, everybody knows the catchwords. It was in our vital interest. Well, that's the conclusion. So we get 100 senators together and we have a debate, and 435 members of Congress, you have a debate. Everybody's going to assert from their position that it either does or does not have a vital national security interest. But that's sort of like weighing the facts in a jury, and you can come to different conclusions. I think it's hard-pressed to believe that, uh, I'm not saying it's a good thing that Syrians would have chemical weapons, but it's a hard-pressed to believe that they have the ability to either launch them in any military way to attack us at home or bring them here somehow. I don't think the Syrians had any intention in the first place of ever launching them at us, although their attitude may have changed in the last week. Now that we're through the raw emotion that governed us in this last week, we can sit back a little bit and go, okay, what, what comes next? Maybe that changes the thinking process a little bit. Paul has been assailed by John McCain and some of the other Republicans. According to McCain, Paul is insignificant and has no influence in the Senate. Funny that Donald Trump actually took McCain or took a Donald Trump took Rand Paul to golf with him the other day because he thought he has influence. If the president thinks it, strange that McCain doesn't believe it at all. Uh, this is the reaction from Rand Paul. He says, if you don't go along with the war party, expect to be attacked as an appeaser. Anybody wants to talk about that? myself included, will be called by the McCains of this world a friend of Vladimir Putin. So as long as we have that kind of stupidity involved in the debate, it makes it very hard to get to what President Obama said and many other thinking people said, that the answer in Syria is ultimately a political solution. Oh, let's go beat him up. Um, it seems to be the solution to so much in this world. And, and again, where were you threatened by what they did? Well, they're not keeping their agreements. Look, look at people who are divorced. They don't keep their agreements. We don't war with them. We have a caller with us. You're up next. You're on the air on KLIX. It's 947. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, 736-0300. 736-0300. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310. KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Piers Morgan chiming in last night on Fox News as a guest of Tucker Carlson, and says mainstream media is downplaying the attack on the Coptic church in Egypt while cheering on what happened in Syria, even though the worldwide war on terrorism is being fought uh, by all people, uh, Bashar al-Assad, and by the Russians, who we will need as allies if we expect that we're going to continue to actually fight this war. Uh, if we can. I'll share that with you in just a moment, but what I'm going to try to do first, I'm going to try to give you a, a caller who I think I lost in my exchange a couple of minutes ago. Caller, you're up next. You're on the air on KLIX. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to speak to the attack in Syria. Um, uh, because of all the saber rattling going on in North Korea and the backing of the Chinese, I think it was uh, more of a global message um, that if you violate international law and you uh, do that sort of thing, it was more of a display of strength for Donald Trump to attack Syria rather than uh, you know commit troops and things like that, which would be unconstitutional. 
But you've, but, you've, you've uh, alienated we'll, we'll you've alienated people like Russia who will need in the war on terrorism. Number two, if you've got a beef with North Korea, we had a legitimate reason to say these guys are threatening to nuke us. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a preemptive strike or do something to at least cripple their capability of doing that. That would I don't I would I would have had a much better time accepting that directly because. They have been spending years making these threats against us, and now they're launching missiles that could eventually do it. Where Syria, again, Assad never was threatening anybody here in this country. No, absolutely. You're right. I mean, I understand yeah. the idea of the message, but in the long run, it's a, it's a good short-term message, I suppose, but in the long run, what's the fallout? Oh, well, you're absolutely right. It was a gamble. There's no doubt about it. And thank you for taking my call. Sure. Thank you much for the call. Uh, 736-0300. Piers Morgan talking about the attack and who the real enemy happens to be, the attack on the Coptic Church over the weekend in Egypt, which he says is getting very little coverage by mainstream media in the West. So you sent out a tweet right after this saying, um, this will not get the attention of massacres in Europe, but it should. Why won't it, do you think? I think, unfortunately, you know, if it happens in the Middle East, this kind of atrocity, it just does not seem to attract the kind of media attention in America that it would if it happened, as we've seen in the attacks in Sweden the uh, last few days, in London two weeks ago. I was there for that huge attention in the American media, you know, in Paris, in Nice, these get huge attention. Uh, and yet what happened in Egypt was unbelievably significant. You know, if you look at what ISIS really stands for, what they are carrying out now in the Middle East and in Egypt in particular is a kind of genocidal attack on Christians and Christianity. They want Christianity eradicated and they want to convert all Muslims to their crusade. They want it to be a holy war and they want Christians gone. And I don't think that narrative is getting the attention it should get in the American media and I have to say in, uh, in other media as well around the world. What's so strange is the West is primarily Christian, predominantly. I mean, that's what makes it the West. And yet there's this sense that it's somehow wrong to root for the home team. When something happens to Christians abroad, it's somehow, I don't know, impolite to mention it because it's self-interested. Have you noticed this? Right. I mean, look, you know, the, ISIS couldn't be more transparent. After the attack in St. Petersburg last week, they made it absolutely clear this is a war against the cross. They said that. That yes. was what the statement said. A war against the cross. By the way, Assad, and we've repeated this over and over, and you're familiar with it too, he is protecting Christians because if the rebels in his country take over, the Christians in Syria are going to die horrible deaths. We have another caller with us, 952. Bill Colley with you on Top Story. And you're up next. You're on KLIX. Hello. Sure, go ahead. I just wanted to touch on a couple things. One thing was uh, your guest this morning talking about the uh, asset forfeiture that Butch Otter vetoed. Yeah. Um, th does anybody really have a good idea of how much money our state and law enforcement agencies and the courts spend on drugs and how expensive – it is to deal with uh, drug crimes and the fallout thereof. Well, I don't know. Um, I, we you... could probably compare that, though, with how much uh, people who are stoned at work cost us economically or driving and some of those issues. And I'm exactly. going to guess and it's probably worse than what we spend. Do people even have a job or are they on welfare? That's a good point. But I, it, and it, I think that the secondly, public, I had a cop tell me one time, I had a fairly libertarian question, he said, we'll keep enforcing these laws as long as the majority of the public wants us to enforce the laws. Yeah. And how much how much property do you think that these people have that are on drugs that are losing assets? Unless they've been selling they them, they don't. really don't. Right. Unless they've been and stealing the it to feed are, a habit. Exactly. Then you got the the 1% or less who has a million-dollar mansion and uh, – Two hundred thousand dollar vehicles, and he's dealing all sorts of kind of drugs. What's wrong with seizing those assets? So, someone, they, there needs to be consequences to this problem. This problem is outrageous, especially in the Northwest. It's 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 out of out of control in our entire country. So, seizing someone's assets is 
is I feel it's necessary because you can't just say, hey, you you uh, bought this house with drug money, you bought these cars with drug money, you don't have any other source of income, you know, it's it's a, it's a crime, and I I'm I feel pretty strong about it. It needs to it re- needs to remain in effect. Well, thank you for the call. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the big time drug dealers. I don't think it, there's an issue there, especially when they're convicted. I think the problem is sometimes people have been pulled over, and if you've got there was a story of a guy that I read this morning related to this uh, in one of the websites doing the story about. Outer's veto, and it said a guy got pulled over. He had forty five hundred dollars cash. He'd taken it out of the bank to go pay a lawyer bill because the lawyer was representing him in a divorce. Should he have gotten a cashier's check? Probably. They, they seized the money from him. And again, that's the type of stuff we're trying to stop. Now, did he get the money back? I believe I've got to go back and find the paper. I believe he did at some point, but he couldn't pay the lawyer on time because of it. But if you get convicted then I don't have a problem with seizing your yacht and your Mercedes or whatever else you're driving and your big estate that you built with drug money. I don't have an issue with that at all. But it's the people who have had, who've been exonerated and then have a difficult time getting money back, or only in some cases, according to one story, here in Twin Falls County, a fellow only got back about a third of what was taken from him. Now, That is a question that needs to be addressed. And we've got to ask people, why do they think that an innocent person's money is theirs? Well, we needed to buy new holsters. and Good. Go to the taxpayers. Make your case. If they believe you're doing a good job of keeping them safe, they'll they'll be willing to pay the taxes that will allow you to keep them safe. Leave it at that. I don't know that we have that many big-time drug dealers in southern Idaho. If If they're in the state... They're likely living, if they're living in a big mansion and they're living up in Sandpoint or Coeur d'Alene and enjoying the view up there. And uh, they're also closer to uh, Route 90 and some of the other big drug trafficking routes. We have some come through here, but I just don't think somebody who's making a killing in drug trafficking is thinking, you know what, I'd really like to settle down and build me a mansion in Filer. Not happening. And one of the quick note on this, when it comes to drugs and what we're, what we're involved with and the like, I heard Otter speak at the gym over at the school in Hanson a few weeks ago at his uh, his uh, Capital for a Day program, and he was sharing with us that in many of our neighboring states, Governor Hickenlooper in uh, Colorado is a Democrat, uh, was behind uh, marijuana legalization, and I believe Governor Brown over in Oregon, same way, she's a Democrat. Otter said, look, he said, they're having second thoughts. <laughs> they're They're not happy with what's been going on in their states. I just wanted to throw that in there quickly if I could. So the notion that this was going to be a big moneymaker for states and uh, the social costs have been much, much higher, and they're struggling to deal with all of that. But then you can't take assets from a drug dealer when the drug is legal now, can you? 957, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, at News Radio 1310.com. Uh, coming up following Fox News at 10 o'clock, I think I remember his name, Rush Limbaugh. Yeah, he's been doing a show for a few years. Rush Limbaugh follows the 10 o'clock news. Following news at 1 o'clock today, Sean Hannity. Following Fox News at 4 o'clock, Glenn Beck. Dave Ramsey tonight, he'll try to talk to you about keeping your money and saving some of it. He's going to be up between 7 and 10 o'clock tonight. And God willing, at the creek don't rise, I'll be back here tomorrow morning. On Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and NewsRadio1310.com.